Good, in, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome uh, to our webinar today on the five steps to the accreditation process. My name is Tracy Serzin. I'm the uh, president of PGLA, and I'm here today to discuss the uh, accreditation process. Uh, really broke it down into five major steps uh, to the process. And throughout the slides today, I'm gonna pull up some examples. So for those that are new uh, to PGLA or, or even those that are just curious that have been with us for a while, I'm gonna pull up some forms and some examples of our, our logo, um, some procedures. I'm gonna take a look at our website just to, just to show everyone, again, some live examples and, and, and forms that you'll expect to see during the accreditation process. I also have a few slides at the end on, on frequently asked questions about the various parts of the process, so we'll go through those. And then at the end, we'll have some time uh, for some Q&A. Just some webinar housekeeping. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and it's gonna be available on our website shortly after we're done here today. Um, if you've noticed, everyone is uh, muted at this time and will continue to be muted for the series of the webinar. Uh, if you have questions uh, as I'm talking uh, throughout the webinar or even you know towards the end, I'll do my best to to get through all those all those questions. but there is a questions toolbar on the far right and again I'll be answering those towards the end. So I want to jump right in. Uh, step one, the application process. So this is the process that you now are considering getting accreditation. You need to have accreditation, uh, whether it's coming from a, a mandate or a regulation or a customer requirement. So some things you need to think about is, okay, I need this accreditation. What kind of company am I? So most of our customers, I would say 99% almost are laboratories, but we also uh, deal with inspection bodies, medical laboratories, reference material producers. So you need to, to think about what standard is best fit for me. So in this case, we're gonna talk, uh, use laboratories as examples. So you know that you need to get ISO IEC 17025. But what you also have to consider is what tests or calibrations, inspections for 17020 do you wanna be accredited for? So being accredited is not just getting accredited to the ISO IEC 17025 standard. You gotta think about what tests do I need to be accredited for? So there are some laboratories that uh, might do hundreds of tests, but really they might have, for example, maybe a food lab, maybe they have a pharmaceutical lab, separate divisions or something, but really where the mandate is coming from is from their food testing. So then they would tell us, I just wanna be accredited for these particular tests. So these are things you need to think about. You know, what standard do you wanna be accredited for? If your lab typically is 17025, sometimes there's additional supplemental requirements above 17025, uh, additional standards that we offer. Uh, so think about the standard, what is your test list, for example? And then also what's important is when do you wanna be accredited by? So once you contact us for accreditation, you, you have the application maybe on hand, or you've contacted us just because you're, you're thinking about becoming accredited. What we usually do here at PGLA is we assign particular project managers to give you a call and talk to you about the process. So they're gonna provide you uh, with an application for accreditation for whatever standard they feel that you would need to be accredited for. They're going to go over, you know, your timelines, you know, how ready are you? We do offer what's called a preliminary assessment. So they're going to ask you, you know, do you have maybe a consultant that's helping you? How far are you in the process? Have you implemented the standard and offer you what we call as a, a pre-assessment? Um, they, you may or may not want that. It's an optional thing to do with your accreditation uh, agreement with us. And at times, if you're struggling with filling out our application anyway, they may also assist you with, with your application. So just taking a quick look, look at what the application will look like. So this is located on our website. We do require customers to complete pages one and two. This is just your basic information about your facility. 
We do want to know if you're doing any sampling, how many employees you have, do you want a pre-assessment, and when do you want to be accredited by. On the lower part of the application, we have different annexes. So here you'll see, for example, if you're a calibration laboratory, you would fill out the calibration annex, and we want to know some of your details. Most importantly, what we want to know right away, at least on the application, is you know, what are you, what are you testing for? What are you calibrating? What are you using? So here is the example calibration annex on our application. And then for example, here is testing. And we do have examples here of how we like this to be filled out. We also on this application, our general LF1 application, do, do have some uh, areas there for reference material provider accreditation and inspection body. So this is what we would need to provide you a quotation for services. And how we quote for our services is really based upon what standard do you want, how many tests, how many calibrations are you listing? Because we base our time upon you know, how many of those tests you want to be accredited for. We do offer a quotation that's for a two-year cycle. So this will include, if you want that pre-assessment, we're going to include that in there. We're going to include what the initial accreditation assessment is going to be and then what your surveillance will be one year later and that will conclude your two-year accreditation cycle during this time your pro project manager will also review your processes what your timelines are maybe you want to know what the assessor availability is because you're on a time crunch they can help you with that and then they're also going to provide you additional tools uh, maybe there's additional policies you need to know about and if you're asking for some client references, we can do that too as well during this stage. One thing I wanted to point out, not even if you're an applicant or someone looking at becoming accredited is on the call today, um, but if you're even an existing customer, is that one thing I recommend that if you're looking at using us for services, or again, you're an existing customer, that you should always try to sign up for our website. So I'm going to click on this here real quick and just show everyone a little bit of of some features of our site. Hopefully I can get to that. Okay, so as a new customer or someone who is already with us, we recommend you to subscribe to our website. So what this does, it gives you all of the information in regard to our policies being updated, our SOPs, you get free training sessions, any events that we have going on. So I recommend that you sign up and subscribe to our website. Uh, you know, at any time during during your cycle of being accredited or if you're not accredited just yet. Uh, going through our website, you'll see here the webinars. So this is where if you're signed up to our site, you just go to our site, you'll see all the webinars that we do for free. Um, you can register through this area as well and you'll be notified if you're a subscriber to our website. Another port, important part of the site is our PGLA documents. So if you click on resources, you're going to see all of the documents here that we offer to our clients. Here's all of the applications. Now, if you contact us for receiving a quote for services, which is on our homepage on our website as well up here, the project manager can send you a blanket application. But if you want to take a look at any of the applications, they're here. Here's all of our checklists. So we do provide our readiness review checklist. These LF 116s, and I'm going to go through them later are all is the checklist that you're going to receive during your scheduling process of documents that need to be turned in ahead of time. We also include all of the checklists that the assessors use. So these are really good tools. So for example, if you're going through a 17025 uh, process or you want to become accredited, here if you look at this checklist, this is the actual checklist the assessors use. It's built around the standard requirements and it gives you an idea of what they're going to be looking for. So we always recommend during this application stage to say, you know, if depending on where the client is, maybe they already have some other certifications or something else that are similar to 17025, you can use this checklist as a gap to see where you are. So this is a, a good source for all new clients or even existing clients, feel free, this is public information. We also have our policies and I'll go through those later but those are really important for you to know. So you're gonna to wanna to know all the PGLA policies because this, these are policies that are on top of the 17025 standard or any ISO standard that you might be getting accredited for that you must adhere to. 
And then here are some of our procedures that are important for our companies to, to be aware of. So those are also here for you to download. So it's important for you to, again, subscribe to our website, but also if you're not gonna subscribe or maybe there's other people in your company that are managing your external list of documents and you're with Perry Johnson and you have to know these certain documents, you know, ensure they at least know where to go. So again, it's under our website, resources, PGLA documents. We also have sections here for technical resources where we offer some free sources with calculators um, for measurement uncertainty, proficiency testing things. We have a list of providers that is not an exhaustive list in any way, um, but if you're looking for a PT provider um, within your laboratory, you can take a look at this list and see what these PT providers provide and uh, look to see if they're a good fit for you. Also here, and we'll go through this when we talk about the certification accreditation side uh, when you get your certificate, but once you get accredited or any company becomes accredited, they then get published uh, on this website. Um, so if you use the search engine, uh, just by typing in a couple initials here, you'll see every client that shows up with these particular initials. The certificate is published. They are hyperlinked here because it goes right to the company website. If you're looking, say you're a test lab and maybe you need to find a calibration laboratory, use our website. You can click on calibration. You can type the word caliper in, for example, and any laboratory that is accredited, that's calibration lab for calipers are gonna appear here. So it's a good, a really good resource for those that are looking for, you know, maybe help with finding a calibration laboratory, or if you're trying to point your customer to your accreditation, this is where you can go. Uh, here, the rest of this is all about the programs we offer, so take advantage of that to look through. Um, we do offer some free steps to accreditation as well on our website, uh, but most importantly, I wanted to point out some things that, you know, in order for you to help prepare for an assessment is to, you know, take a look at these policy documents uh, to see what we're all about and what's expected of you. Okay, so once you fill out your application, you have a discussion with your project manager, they have enough information to provide you a quote, they will provide that to you. If you're happy with that quotation, they will ask you for your commitment and, and where you're at with, with agreeing to using PGLA for your service provider. You will be required to sign an agreement and provide a deposit, and that deposit is credited back on your initial assessment invoice. So once we receive those two pieces, the agreement and your deposit is received, we then offer what's called a pending letter of accreditation. So a lot of clients like these because they have some, maybe some pressure from their customers asking them to become accredited. Perhaps maybe they're a regulated lab by state or federal where they need to show in order for licensing purposes that they're in the process. So this pending letter is, is really nice actually for our customers to have. It demonstrates that you're committed to becoming accredited. Uh, includes what's standard, and again, it assists it assist you with satisfying your customers until you can get through that process. Um, but you can't get that until you finalize your agreement and provide your deposit. Okay, step two, the preliminary assessment process. So this is the process where once you've, you've uh, committed to PGLA as your accreditation service provider, your paperwork will then be uh, submitted over to a designated accreditation program assistant. Uh, acronym is our APAs. These are uh, a group of uh, assistants that help our clients um, from really from start to finish. So you have your project manager that helps you sign up and contract, and they're always there to support. But the accreditation program assistants are the ones that will contact you to say, I have your application. Uh, I have somewhat of a timeline because you told the project manager when you're thinking, let's get going in the process. So they're going to be the ones to send you that pending letter based on the time frame of when you think you're going to become accredited. They're going to then send you a scope, uh, which is based on what you filled out on the application. And they're going to ask you to take a look at it because what they're trying to do is confirm your final scope before the assessment goes. So that might go back and forth a little bit um, to get it really clean and concise 
um, so it's ready to go on the website really when the process is done. So they'll talk to you about, about all these things, your time frame, uh, get your scope cleaned up. The scope will then go to our program managers to approve it before the assessment goes. If there's any questions, they'll let you know to fill in some blanks if there's, again, any, any hesitation with certain areas. Uh, once that scope is established, we then will assign an assessor, and they're going to be assigned based on your company, what you do, what you test, what you calibrate, and then they're going to be, you know, lined up for the dates that you want. So there might be a little bit of back and forth um, going on, um, but eventually we we get it all scheduled with your correct scope, your correct test list, and with an assessor who's best suited for you. Once we get those dates confirmed. We then will send you a confirmation of that schedule with the dates and who your assessor is. And then we're going to ask you for a list of documents that need to be turned in 30 days in advance to avoid any type of cancellation. So I want to talk about the pre-documentation requirements because this comes up quite a bit uh, with customers asking, what do I need to do before, you know, before I actually have the on-site assessment? So this process is actually pretty important because. We want to make sure that the, the clients are ready for an initial accreditation. Um, and it also prepares your assessors uh, for your assessment. And again, you don't want the assessor coming in and, and you don't have enough things ready and you know they're coming in for the day and leaving. It just it just wastes a lot of time and costs for everyone. So this this process, we really want clients to do their best to submit their paperwork 30 days in advance. So looking at this form, I'm going to show you one that we would send for a 17025 client. And this happens every year. Here's your list of documentation that needs to be turned in 30 days in advance. So this is the form you're going to get. Uh, this is a template, so you will see who to, who to return it all back to. But just to go through this, it's not that much uh, information we're really asking for, but this is important things because we want to make sure you're ready. If there's something that maybe you don't have, it might not be necessarily a showstopper. Um, it will be something that your assessor will discuss with you when they come on site. If you don't have really any of these things listed, it might be something you might consider and say, you know what, I, I don't have any of this. I probably need to push off this assessment. Um, but these are things that you can take a look at ahead of time. This form is available on our website for all different programs, and you can have an idea of what you're going to be expected to, to turn in. We usually provide the clients with a... Uh, some type of like OneDrive or cloud-based system to upload your documents and folders so it's nice and organized for your assessors. We ask you to confirm your scope one more time to make sure there's no changes or no changes to your organization since we've been there last. So this is not just for initial assessments, we actually send this out for every, for every assessment. Clients are also asked to sign a scheduling acknowledgement form. Again, that's who your assessor is. Um, we want to make sure that you have the right to know if they work for another company. We do have some assessors that do work for other laboratories. So we will inform you of that on this form. If there's any conflicts, you do have the right to object to that assessor. If you want, you can ask for a copy of the bio for the assessors. That's completely fine. Uh, maybe before the scheduling process, you might say, you know, I really like to see a couple options of assessors so I can see who, I'd, who would be best fit for me, that's okay as well. But one thing that's important too is that once all these things are turned in and everything is scheduled, we do wanna make sure that if you change your mind on your assessment or something comes up, that you do uh, notify us 21 days before that on-site assessment to avoid any charges. Okay, so moving on, step three to the on-site assessment process. So the assessors, once everything is confirmed, they have your documentation, they feel they're ready to go, they will reach out to you about 14 days before to develop an assessment plan. So an assessment plan is going to include what time do you want to start, um, who are my guides, is there anything I need to know about your facility, you know, with confidentiality, or maybe they need uh, certain safety gear. Uh, they might ask you some questions about the documentation review they did just in general, um, if there's anything they need to know um, from that. And then they'll create the plan accordingly based on your discussion. Then when we arrive at your facility per the plan, 
Um, we will conduct an opening meeting. Again, we're going to go over this is, you know, an assessment to, for example, 17025 for this particular test list. Usually in the opening meeting, you can have your quality manager, lab manager. Sometimes presidents might sit into the opening meeting too because they want to be, of course, part of and attuned to the assessment. We're going to confirm the scope again. Again, go over the standard, who's going to be who's going to be helping us. Sometimes there's more than one assessor too. So it could be a plan that's broken up. You know, sometimes the lead assessor may be assigned and they might be doing all your quality management system criteria and the standard, and some might be out looking at your laboratory from a technical aspect. So it just depends on the size of your lab and, and who we have uh, set aside there for your for your team. So again, if more than one assessor is assigned, they, again, they might split off. Um, you know, what to expect during the on-site assessment. So, you know, we, we don't have too much difficulty with this, but we really want the clients uh, to be able to engage as many of their employees as possible. And the reason for that is you have to remember that ISO accreditation is a competency assessment. So we're there to evaluate each laboratory or each organization based on their list of tests or based on the list of calibrations and at the end of the day when we issue that certificate it's saying that we have deemed this laboratory competent to perform a certain list of tests and a certain list of calibrations so when a laboratory has multiple technicians you know we want to be able to have a chat with them we don't want to talk to just one person we want to see what everyone is doing we want to make sure that Everyone is understanding your current SOPs, your work instructions, your test methods, and, and they can demonstrate that to us um, during the time of the assessment. So expect that, you know, your assessor may, you know, want to talk to someone as they're prepping a, prepping a sample or getting ready to do a calibration. Witnessing of activities is required for our on-site assessment. So, it's sometimes it's impossible to witness a complete test from start to finish because we could sit there for weeks depending on the test. But we want to be able to say that we witnessed at least a portion of that test. That's really important and it's part of our accreditation criteria. There might be instances where maybe you have nothing during that time to be able to show us, but we at least expect you to make the best effort to be able to show us a portion of a test, even if it's a sample that you've developed or got from somewhere else, if it's not a real project that you're working on, just so we can watch something being performed. Um, there are times where we will do record verification because maybe, uh, again, there's nothing available for us to actually witness because there's no work in house, but we do like to witness some of these activities. Okay, the on site assessment will be uh, a review of your quality management system. So here you'll see uh, various bullet points of things that are in your quality management system. We're going to want to take a look at your organizational structure, your, your legal entity, how you handle confidentiality and impartiality, what's your internal audit process, your corrective action process, did you do a management review, do you identify improvements within your laboratory or your organization, what records and documentation do you have? Who are your suppliers and how you do your contracting? So all these things could be part of the quality management system review and also part of your technical review too. So this usually includes discussions with the quality manager and any other relevant staff. So you'll expect that your assessor will be sitting down going over these topics. We wanna to know how you manage these processes and where are the requirements documented. So for example, if it says, why well, I have a procedure on how I handle my internal audits, for example, and I have a plan for internal audits and I do my internal audits quarterly, or maybe I do them all, all, all at once, once per year. It's up to you how you determine how you do that. But we wanna make sure we can see the, you know, the procedures for that, the work instructions for that, whatever you have in place to state how you're gonna be performing these things. And it's not only important to see a procedure, but we wanna see you know, how you've done this. So for example, going back to internal audits, we can say we can look at your procedure, we can look at your plan, but what we're gonna to wanna to look at is, can I see evidence that you did it? So a lot of times you'll see in a checklist maybe being completed, maybe you had non-conformances during your internal audit. So we're gonna be looking at all that to make sure you're actually following that particular procedure. 
So if you're new and you haven't really had a lot of uh, internal audits would, wouldn't be the best example for that, but let's say, let's give another example, maybe complaints. And that's more in the technical area now, the 17025 standard, the process area. But say you had no complaints or you've had, maybe you had no, or no nonconformities internally or through a complaint process system. So we're going to be looking at, you know, we have a procedure, but at least show me your templates, at least show me how you're going to do it. So again, it's still part of a, something that you're going to be using for a record, but there are some laboratories that are so new that they really don't have much documented, but still expect if you don't, we're still going to ask and have a discussion with you on how you're going to do something. Okay, and the technical review, here's all the list of things that we're going to be looking at. So again, this is based upon what you applied for. So if you remember I talked about, we want to know what tests, what calibrations, what inspections do you want to be accredited for? So we're going to, on an initial accreditation assessment, we will look at all of the tests you've applied for. And we're going to be looking at, you know, the personnel who's performing those tests, for example, what equipment is being used, what's your environmental conditions, all these things, SOPs, validations, your proficiency testing related to each test on your application. So the bulk of our assessment really is going to be in your laboratory or in any technical area of your inspection body. We're going to be out in the field with you uh, looking at all these things for everything you applied for. Then we want to witness test as much as we can. We're going to look at your proficiency testing records. Some of those are going to be given to us ahead of time, but we're going to sit down with you and go through your proficiency testing, what you perform. If you fail a proficiency testing, how do you handle that? Do you take a corrective action? Do you repeat your, your proficiency test? We're going to look at your verification or validation of your method records as well. So we're going to be asking for a lot of, a lot of records, a lot of examples, um, for again, for every test that you want to be accredited for. Now, during the time of the assessment as well, if you have non-conformities, again, it's okay. This is what we're there to do. We're supposed to, we're supposed to be there to add some value to you and let you know what you're not complying with in the standard. But usually the lead assessor should be briefing you on, you know, this is where we're at today. So if it's a three-day assessment, you know, maybe on day one, they're going to say, I'm doing pretty good, no non-conformities today. But day two, you have a couple, you know, so they should let you know, this is where we're looking at, you know, at the end of your assessment, we have a couple findings here, uh, just so there's no surprises. During the closing meeting, when all of the assessment is done, we're done looking at the lab, we're done doing our technical review, our quality management system, we will hold a closing meeting. Uh, that can be with different people, if you'd like. Um, most of the time, it's with the same people that go to the, the opening meeting. And during that time, you should be given a copy of your nonconformances and your final assessment report. Depending on the number of nonconformities you have, it might come uh, maybe 24 hours later if the assessor is, is running short on some time, especially if we're on site and we have to catch some off flight. Uh, but you should know during the closing meeting at least a briefing of the findings you have. During this time, the assessors will ask you um, if you agree with the findings and they will ask you to um, initial the nonconformance report um, and go through them with you, make sure you have a clear understanding. They also will let you know um, if something happens after the time of the assessment, even though if you sign it and you have, now you have time to sync something in after, maybe you discuss the finding with someone else, maybe the assessor missed something, It's not they're not perfect. Sometimes you can go back to the assessor and say, you know, I think you missed this. Sometimes they might remove a finding. It's a, it's a, a big possibility. But if the assessor feels that it is a nonconformance, uh, they usually stick with that nonconformance. And during the closing, I mean, they will tell you you have the right to dispute or appeal a nonconformity. So we're going to talk about that later on in the presentation on how you can handle that process. So nonconformities, we were just discussing those. This is part of a, a, a snapshot here of our nonconformance form. But this is an example of what a nonconformance report looks like. Uh, so nonconformances shall be clear and include the finding, the objective evidence that was looked at, and the standard citation. So the assessors are trained to be able to write findings only if they go back to an actual requirement of the standard. 
So this one here example, uh, this finding was that not all equipment observed was labeled to identify its calibration status. This is the objective evidence that they saw uh, regarding thermometers. And then they went right back to the 17025 standard under 649. If they can't go back to a finding, but it's something in the standard that's maybe a should instead of a shall um, or a may, they might, uh, based on discussion with your situation, with, with your lab staff, they might write you also what's called an observation. An observation does not have to be responded to. Um, it's just more of a, you know, this could turn into nonconformances. We're seeing this. You're not doing it, but it's not a finding right now. A major or minor are nonconformities. The assessor, once they provide you your nonconformance report, they're going to provide you with one of the time frame for when the corrective action is due. So corrective action is due to the assessor by email. And we also like you to send it to this address here. It's actually on the bottom of your form, ca at pglabs.com, within 60 days from the last day of the assessment. So we do that uh, just so we can keep track too. Our assessors get pretty busy, uh, not giving an excuse, but they do. And we wanna make sure if we see a corrective action come in from our client that we're following up with our assessors to make sure they're on top of it. They have about a week uh, once they get your corrective action responses uh, to provide to review it and then close up the assessment material or give you a response back, whether they approved it or rejected it. If requested during this the the closure of your uh, assessment as well, uh, you could ask if you need this because you have a client that's asking you how you're doing. We do offer what's called a recommendation letter. So you would go back to your accreditation program assistant and ask them if they can please provide you with that and we'll communicate with the assessor if that's okay, if everything has been cleared. So just, you know, an extra thing that we offer to our clients on top of a pending letter, this kind of gives your clients an idea that you've actually finished your assessment. It doesn't give any details about how many findings you had or anything like that. It just shows that you've had your assessment and you've been recommended at this point for accreditation. So what we expect with the corrective action process is that the corrective action should be submitted on your own form. So in 17025 or any of the ISO standards we accredit to requires that you have a corrective action process. We want you to use your own form. We used to back in the day have our own template form for clients to submit, um, but we felt that we really, really they should be using their own form because they need to document it in their corrective action logging anyway. So we, we changed that over the past few years. But you should supply your corrective action response on your own form. You want to make sure that you have a reason for a cause. How did, how did your corrective action or what, what led you to this problem? So we want you to really think about it. Um, ensure that your files are labeled clearly for the assessor as well. So when you submit your corrective actions back, you know, it's nice if you can label them. So if you have five NCRs, you to potentially make folders or label your fold, uh, files that say NCR 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. And then you're going to want to provide your objective evidence to your correction as well to, the, to that corrective action. And you want to make sure that you're numbering them too. This avoids, honestly, a, a delay in the review process or even potentially rejecting something because they just don't see it. So again, corrective action you know, should really be thought through you know, think about what your cause is for why this certain situation happened. And again, it could be multiple things. Maybe something wasn't written down. There was a lack of training. It's just a broken process. But the assessors like to see that you took the time to, to uh, do a good root cause and then take the corrective action to ensure that this doesn't, you know, occur again. And then corrective action isn't just for us to appease us. Yes, it's part of the process, but it's really to make your, to make your process better. Upon receipt of the corrective action, the assessor will review them to ensure a few things. So they're going to make sure that your corrective action effectively closes the finding. So if you get a nonconformance and your corrective action is way out there, has nothing to do with the actual finding, they're going to tell you and they're going to reject that nonconformance. We want to make sure that the objective evidence actually provides support of the closure. So for example, if you had a nonconformance because you didn't provide or you didn't complete an internal audit, but
but you only provide us a procedure that's probably not going to work um, because the non-conformance was against not having an internal audit. So that means we'll be looking for evidence that you did an internal audit and that you maybe adjusted your plan to make sure that you continue to, the, to the, do the internal audits on time or you maybe done some training with someone who didn't understand the process. So it depends on what the situation is. So the assessor at the time of the corrective action submission, they're gonna decide whether approve or reject the submission. So there, it is a possibility, especially if you're a new client, that don't be surprised at times, um, you know, if your non-conform corrective actions might uh, get rejected, it's, it's completely common, maybe one or two of them. It's okay, um, the assessor will is, is pretty patient uh, with the clients. They just have to be able to you know, meet our timelines as well as far as getting those in. So I mentioned earlier that you have a 60 day time period to submit your corrective actions. So I don't recommend waiting till day 59, you know, maybe submit on day 45 if you're a new client. Um, that way it saves you some time there for the 60 day goal to get the corrective actions closed and cleared up. Once the assessor does approve everything, they'll let you know, and then they will submit their material uh, with evidence that the corrective action has been closed to our headquarters office, telling us that they've now closed the assessment. So really we're getting real close to the final stages here. Once those corrective actions get closed, we then are into the final accreditation process. So once that all their material comes in, their checklist, everything we require of them, plus your corrective action closure, we then uh, prep that material and we send it to our final accreditation decision committee, which is called our executive committee. And that executive committee actually are members that are independent from the assessors. They don't have a conflict of interest. They're qualified with the standard and also with your field of accreditation. Um, they actually are the final authorization body to either grant or deny accreditation. So the assessor makes the recommendation but our executive committee actually makes that final decision. If the material for some reason comes back rejected from the committee, wouldn't sweat it too much, but sometimes it's the assessor needs to make some corrections to some of the forms um, or clarify something for the executive committee. So most of the time when it gets rejected, the assessor is the one that gets has, usually fixes the issue. But there is has been some instances where we've had to go back to the client particularly or your assessor will come back to you um, for some additional documentation um, because you get just again just because you get rejected does not mean that you're not going to get accredited there's just a couple more things that the executive committee uh, wants to have in order to feel comfortable making that decision uh, the assessor if you if you weren't even close to becoming accredited that would be something that you would know really during the time of your assessment once the committee uh, grants accreditation we're then notified here at headquarters that we can now issue your final scope so it's a, the final scope looks very similar to the application to the scope that the, the, the accreditation program assistant is going to send you to clear, clear up prior to the assessment but this is something though that could change so many times so during your assessment you might find that maybe one of your instruments went down and we actually can't accredit credit you for that rate then at the end of the assessment. So the assessor will clean up that final scope and put that in their assessment package so we know that there's been a change. You'll also go over that final scope with your assessor so that you're okay um, with everything they're putting on there. And you also are signing a certificate application saying I'm okay with this scope as well. So there shouldn't be a lot of surprises with your final draft scope uh, because you're already going over it one last time with your assessor. Uh, the scope will go through our program management again to make sure that it's, it meets our criteria and we'll send it to you for review. You will get a draft certificate first, again, to, re to review. We ask that you look at it thoroughly, um, approve and return the acknowledgement form saying it looks good, and then you'll receive a final copy. So we also want to make sure that all clients, if there's any outstanding balances that you have, um, that you're clearing those up uh, before this process occurs because we don't issue final certificates until those are paid. You'll get an e-copy, electronic copy of your certificate and you also will get a hard copy in the mail. Um, also, I showed you earlier the website. 
your accreditation will then be posted on the PGLA website so you can refer your customers to it if you like. Here's an example of a certificate I part, I apologize, it's a little blurry, but this is what your final certificate will look like. This is just a marked up one um, from one of our testing facilities, but you'll get your name and your address, the standard, your basic fields of accreditation, and then you're gonna have some sort of testing list in the back. So it's really important that you know, you know that it's not just one page, it's gonna be whatever you're accredited for, Example, if you're a test lab, you're gonna have all these tests listed on the back of your certificate. Certificates include an initial accreditation date, they include an expiration date, certificate number, and an accreditation number. Your initial accreditation date is the first date you became accredited. It's like your anniversary date. So every time you renew accreditation again, this date was never going to change. When you're a brand new client, this issue date and initial date actually can be the same date because it's based upon our your first time you became accredited. But when you renew, an issue date will be the renewal date the executive committee approved you for. So they could be a little bit different, but this just shows your history over time. You'll then get an expiration date, which is based upon our two year cycle. And we actually base your expiration date based off your, we call it your flag date or your due date. And then we give you a little extra time after. So every year, if you like going in the month of February for whatever reason, by having an expiration date set up this way, it allows you to go every February, gives you time to answer your process, your corrective actions, and then you don't have any type of lapse in your accreditation. So it still is a two-year cycle, but our expiration dates don't exactly match the two years. So I know this is a lot of words here, um, but it definitely has worked for us in the past and it keeps clients happy. They stay, they like to be able to uh, you know, schedule on their certain months that they're used to us coming out. You do get a certificate number, and what's important about this, um, this number is issued each time a certificate is issued or revised. So if you're using your certificate number in your marketing material or your website, be careful with that because you're going to have to update, update that every time. So we give two numbers. One is your certificate number, and it can show a revision to it, again, every time you change it or you get renewed. But your permanent number really is your accreditation number. That's something that you can refer when you're doing any marketing, your 17025 accredited with your accreditation number. That's going to change as long as you're with, P or that is not going to change as long as you're with PGLA. Okay, so I wanna go through a couple things, some FAQs um, about some things that we, we get a lot um, from clients not only before they become accredited, but also uh, during the, you know, even during the time after they've been accredited for a year or so, just, just, so just to refresh everyone on some of our requirements. So one question is what happens after you become accredited? So we do require a 12 month surveillance. So in your agreement for services with us, it's a two year cycle. We do require a surveillance visit to come in and, and check to see how you're doing. We're gonna look at your past corrective actions, see how you've implemented those. And then there's some annual things during your, and uh, the standard that you're required to do. So we're gonna be checking those. Typically surveillances are about a day, depending on the size of your laboratory or your company. And uh, with that, you know, there is a similar corrective action process. We don't issue a new certificate because your certificate is still in good standing. If something would go wrong during your surveillance where you had severe issues, we could, you know, make some changes to your certificate, remove things if we had to. Um, but for the most part, they, you know, you just are just doing a surveillance and you're getting a report from us. This is done 12 months from the first, uh, from your initial accreditation assessment date, not from the time that you got a certificate issued, but 12 months from your initial assessment. After that surveillance, your certificate then 12 months later is going to expire because we issue a two year certificate. You'll then be asked to renew your accreditation. So it's really important to try to stay on this two year schedule because you really wanna avoid a lapse of accreditation or expiration. A reassessment is a full system assessment. So we're gonna go through your entire laboratory again and the entire standard. It's the same corrective action process. What's different with this versus the surveillance, we do have your paperwork go through our executive committee again to make a decision to continue or renew your accreditation or potentially deny if there's any problems. We then issue a new certificate for two more years. 
So what if you want to expand your scope? We get this question a lot is that when people want to become accredited for the first time, uh, you know, what do I, you know, what do I do? You know, I, I don't really know what I want to be accredited for, but I want to start small and that's totally fine. Um, but they want to expand their scope, which means they want to add more tests or more calibrations, inspections, whichever, to your uh, certificate of accreditation. So those can really occur at any time. Uh, you would just have to contact your accreditation program assistant uh, to ask them for the forms you need to complete. And we really only need to know at this stage what you really what you really want to add. You can do these during your routine assessments, your surveillances or reassessments, or you can do them alone. There is still a corrective action process. Our executive committee will make a decision again on your expansion, and then we'll revise your certificate again once you're approved. Now, some scope expansions, depending on what you're wanting to add. So for example, say it's the same piece of equipment that you already have on your scope, and you just want to add some additional analytes, additional test. We might be able to do that offline completely and just do a review of your SOP and some other documents um, just offline and then go ahead and add it to your scope. So it really depends on what exactly you're asking to add. Uh, just some things for clients to know, uh, new or existing, is really what's your obligation to maintain your accreditation? So all clients get a copy of our agreement for services. And inside the agreement for services, there's multiple documents that are referred. Um, one of them is our SOP1 accreditation procedure. So I showed you earlier on the website a list of documents that you're gonna really wanna pay attention to if they get revised. Our SOP1 accreditation procedure is it's a pretty heavy document, but it goes over all the processes and also goes over anything that you're supposed to be doing as a, as a company accredited with us. So really as a client, you know some of these obligations in order for you to keep your accreditation going to avoid any type of suspension is some of these things. So we just ask you to schedule on time you're due every 12 months. Try to keep within those time frames. Meet your financial obligations. Avoid any activity that may, may put PGLA's reputation in jeopardy. Um, we find out for some reason there's unethical practices within your facility, your misleading marketing, and proper use of accreditation. This could result in some type of suspension or withdrawal of your accreditation. So it's really important. Um, you know, we don't really have this problem much but it is something that's in our agreement for services that we have the right to suspend a laboratory or organization if we find any of this out. Um, allow your assessors uh, the flexibility to be able to witness all your activities, including staff within your facility. Um, for calibration labs, a good example would be uh, if you are calibrating at client, client facilities uh, to try to help in, and plan out your assessment to where you're gonna be having someone go out and do a calibration on a customer site. We want to be able to see those things from time to time. If you have a complaint that someone has issued and we deem that a legitimate complaint, we ask that you make sure you answer those complaints in a timely manner. Always try to follow the ISO standard. And another thing is too is to notify us if you have any major changes like ownership, address, you've moved, you have some equipment changes. If you happen to, you know, have some things that occur in your facility, financial issues, you can't schedule, you know, there are some things that, you know, we have no choice as an accreditation body. We have to follow our own rules as a uh, ILAC accreditation body following ISO 1711 requirements. So we have to monitor these things. So if for some reason, for example, uh, let's say that you can't schedule on time, we've been contacting, something's happened, or you, you can't meet certain obligations, we do send you some type of warning letter to let you know if we don't get something handled, you know, we could turn this into a suspension. We don't get the results we needed, you do get suspended. Um, during the suspension stage, you can't claim accreditation on anything. You can't on accredited reports, you have to inform your pertinent customers as well. And then you get moved to the suspension list on our website. If you can't resolve that suspension within a certain period of time, we fully withdraw an accreditation. And in order to come back to becoming accredited, you have to start the process all over again. So what's key here is just to communicate with us that there's something going on financially, you need to be on a payment plan. You know, it's all about communicating with us. If you can't schedule for some reason, Again, communicate, let's see if we can work something out. We hate to see clients go into this particular stage.
Uh, if you need to understand our process for suspensions and withdrawal, we do have our procedure on our website, it's SOP 11. Okay, uh, how can you market your accreditation using the PGLA accreditation symbol or even the ILEC mark? So upon the receipt of your final certificate that you'll be getting from your accreditation program assistant, your designated person here, they are going to provide you your PGLA accreditation symbol. And just to point out to everyone, this is not the same as our logo. So you'll notice here, here you'll see PGLA, and for example, let's say you're a testing laboratory, you will be getting a symbol that says PGLA testing. If you're calibration, you'll get one that says PGLA calibration. We'll then provide you with our SOP3, which you need to have uh, available during your assessment too as an external document, uh, but you need to follow these rules. If you wanna use this ILAC mark, that's great. You can use that in combination with this, but there are rules for that. You have to ask for approval and you have to fill out a form or a waiver to use that. For the PGLA symbol, you don't have to seek our approval. You just need to get the right copy but when you want to use both of these, there is a process. So I recommend you read SOP3, you look at that, make sure you're setting up your logos appropriately and you're using the language appropriately. If not, you could get a non-conformance from our office if we find it or during your next assessment, it will be looked at. So this includes your website, your reports, any marketing material. Um, assessors will be looking at these things. So what happens if you change uh, your location, ownership, or company name? Uh, you do want to notify us of this. You're going to contact your accreditation program assistant. Location changes will require a site review within 60 days of the move. Uh, what we're going to be doing is reviewing your environmental conditions, equipment capability. We want to make sure you have a legitimate facility, obviously. But we do require some type of review within 60 days. If you have a change of ownership, will require proof of that change and a statement on how this change will or may impact any activities related to your accreditation and then the effective date. If you just have a name change, no ownership change, will require proof of the name change and the effective date for that change. So other than the standard, what other documents will you be assessed to? Uh, so PGLA is required per our international requirements to have uh, additional criteria set forth with our conformity assessment bodies or labs or inspection bodies, whichever. And here are the documents that you're going to want to be uh, knowledgeable of as they relate to you. So I recommend that these are all on the PGLA website and your project manager should inform you of this as well. But these are all the documents that you're going to want to review and you're going to want to have on your list of external documents. If you're not an inspection body, obviously you wouldn't have to have that. Um, if you're not a testing lab, you wouldn't have to have work instruction eight. Uh, so it depends on what your what your laboratory is. But you need to make sure you have these documents available, understand them, sign up to our website, make sure you're privy to all the changes that are occurring. Okay, another question we get is, what if I can't find a third-party proficiency testing PT provider? Uh, this is something that, and 17025 requires you to uh, perform proficiency testing or inter-lab comparisons to monitor the quality of your results. But on top of that, we have our policy on proficiency testing. So on our website, I showed you earlier, there's a list of PT providers. You could take a look to see if they can help support the activities you're doing. But in some cases, we get some unique facilities and there are no third-party providers. So what you need to do is take a look at our policy and we give you some options. So you can do what's called an inter-lab comparison, maybe find another laboratory to compare your data to. You don't need to seek our any type of approval to do that. Uh, we will just be looking at that when we come on site or we ask them for that information prior to the assessment. But you don't need to seek our special approval to do an inter-lab comparison with another competent laboratory. You can do intralab comparisons if you absolutely cannot do intralab intra comparisons. Some laboratories, again, might be unique. There is no one else really that can they can compare their results to, so they have to they have to seek other alternatives. So that would be an intralab comparison where you can compare results internally. This does 
uh, require our approval and uh, an SOP. So we want to see how you're going to do this and why you're going to do it. If you can't do intralab comparisons, for example, then we will accept repeatability studies. Uh, this is really the last source, but again, you, you still must seek our approval and provide your reasoning for doing that. Proficiency testing shall be a planned activity and you should document this on a four-year plan. Plans only need to be approved for intralab and repeat studies. Uh, the assessor will look at your plan for these other things, but for exceptions, you only need to get our approval for the intralab and repeat, repeat studies. So you wanna make sure you do that before you go and assume that you can do intralab and just do these, you need to talk to us about it first because your assessor is going to ask you, did you obtain PGLA approval? And if you haven't, it's a shall in the policy and you could get a nonconformity. Proficiency testing shall be conducted annually for at least one field of accreditation and remaining over the next four years. And again, we have some PT providers on our website that you can uh, take a look at to see if they're a good fit for you. Another question we get is, what if my calibrator of my instruments does not meet PL2, which is our traceability policy requirements? So in our policy required that you use accredited sources, but in some cases, the person doing the calibration is the best person for what you're doing. Um, and you don't wanna switch providers necessarily. Uh, they're the most competent, maybe it's the manufacturer uh, that they don't wanna become accredited. It's a it's a possibility. So what you need to be aware of is that there is a uh, exception uh, for not using a 17025 accredited lab for calibration activities, for example, um, where you'd have to ask them to fill out our traceability form. And this will be look this will be looked at during your assessment because remember we're looking at equipment. We're looking at is it adequate for your testing uh, testing lab, for example. And if we don't see that the laboratory who performed your calibration on your instrument is they're not accredited, we're going to ask you why not. And if you say, well, this is because of the manufacturer and this is why, we still want to have some type of traceability form. So I'm going to click on this form. This is available on our website. And this explains what traceability is. So it seems a little heavy, but this is something if you're not going to use an accredited source, then we need to make sure that the that the calibration has some type of program in place that meets this requirement. This comes right from the NIST website. Okay, so what if I don't agree with an assessment finding or a decision made by PGLA? So I mentioned this earlier that all clients or interested parties have the right to dispute and appeal a decision made regarding nonconformities or suspension or withdrawal activities, really anything that we might make a decision on regarding your accreditation. So we ask that you follow our dispute and appeal procedure. I'm actually the one that handles a lot of the disputes and appeals unless it relates to something that is my, uh, my process particularly. Uh, but all disputes are reviewed, they'll be for legitimacy, and then they're sent to like an ad hoc committee. So I don't make, I'm not the one that actually makes the decision on the dispute, I find um, two to three people um, to take a look at the situation. For example, most of the time disputes are based on um, nonconformities and competent people, not part of the assessment that have no conflict of interest that reviews why you're disputing something and then we'll make a decision. So they could say, well, the nonconformance is gonna stand and this is why, remove the nonconformity or just make it an observation. So we ask that you send those in per our policies within 10 days from the last day of the assessment if you're gonna dispute a finding. Does PGLA have a complaint process? We do have a complaint process. So if, and we are required to have one, if you have a problem with something that occurred on site or maybe something that we need to work on here internally, please use our complaint process if you want to uh, forge a formal complaint, we will be responsive to that and provide you a corrective action on what we've done to address the complaint. If you find that there's something else um, that you uh, seen in the industry and you wanna share that with us with appropriate objective evidence that you would like something to be addressed, maybe you have a problem with the calibration laboratory, for example, if you're a test lab and they're not reissuing your report, they're not responding, you know, that's where we can get, you know, get involved. We ask that you try to work it out with them first but if you can't, we do have a complaint process that we can uh, we can document the issue and follow up with that particular client. 
Uh, lastly, what type of training do we offer? So just like we're doing today, uh, we do have free monthly webinars on certain topics of the ISO standards. We offer public courses and client facility courses um, in regard to internal audit, measurement uncertainty. We also offer some free tools you can download from our websites and measurement uncertainty calculators. Uh, how do I take advantage of PGLA client spotlights, press releases, social media? Uh, these are different options you have. So if you're a brand new client and you want to announce your accreditation, let your accreditation program assistant know. It will go to our marketing department, uh, Kristen, who is really good at writing up some, some articles on for our newsletter or maybe our social media site. Sometimes we share things on other sites or we just help you write an article. Um, and we'll ask you certain things about your experience with accreditation. We want you to talk about your laboratory. And, you know, it can go from anywhere to a half page to a full page article. And we don't charge you for it either. So take advantage of that. If you're interested, let us know. We're uh, happy to help uh, put your information out there and share it on our social media. Sometimes we also belong to certain uh, web portals or websites, or newsletters uh, outside of PGLA that we might even share your announcement on with your permission. Okay, so I know this went a little longer than expected today, so I apologize for that. At this time, what I'd like to do is take a look at some of the questions, if we have any that came in. Um, if you just give me just a few minutes here, I'm gonna take a look at that and we'll go through some of those questions. Okay, so we had, uh, apologize for the delay on that. So the one first question we had um, was, it, is it easier to achieve ISO accreditation by following or adopting AOAC methods if they're available? Well, so that's a good question. So with accreditation, if you look at the 17025 standard particularly, um, it does say that if you, if there's a national test method that's available, um, that you should attempt to use that method. Sometimes it's not always possible. Um, so you have a little bit more work to do. So if you create in-house methods because you can't follow a national standardized methods available for your certain test, um, you know, it does make it more challenging, I guess, for you really as a laboratory because you, you might have to make a modification or you have to create your own, which requires you to validate your method. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, yeah, it definitely would be easier if you just select a method um, that's available out there in the industry, but it depends on what you have going on and if that method is appropriate for you. So it does make the assessment go a little faster um, because we're not looking at all your validations, you're just verifying you know, your test method. Okay, another question is how do you handle moving locations, example, moving the lab from one location into another building? I think I just went over that, so I think I might have answered that question, but just real quick. Um, if you're moving into another location, you can let your accreditation program assistant know as a heads up, we're gonna be moving soon. Uh, they will guide you through that process. Uh, what we need again is, you know, what's your new address and when, and then what we do is send you a amendment for a contract amendment noting uh, that your new location is listed here and then we schedule an on-site visit to evaluate that new location. Uh, 
did get a question about um, in Michigan, the cannabis industry, uh, the license stacking from the state for medical and adult use product testing. One, if license stacking is allowed, do these labs need to have separate equipment, rooms, stocks? Um, do they go through individual ISO accreditation or one ISO for both markets? Okay, so I'm trying to, uh, I am not the state of Michigan, so I don't know, I can't answer about licensing requirements about different labs. Um, I know that they have particular requirements if if you're testing for cannabis in one lab, um, but something else in a different lab, and they want their instrumentations to be completely separate is my understanding. If you have two laboratories, how we would handle that is really look at how they're related. Um, we would we are we are able to combine assessments if a company has two different laboratories within a facility, um, even though they have two different scopes. So that's uh, that's not a problem um, with us at all. Okay, someone has asked again about the PT provider where on your website. If you go under resources, again, check there, you'll see proficiency testing. Click on that and you'll see a list of providers. Uh, next question, do you have plans or options for remote or virtual accreditations? So we do actually. So we... Uh, Right now, if you're a current client or you're again looking for accreditation, if you're a current client, you've already been exposed uh, to what's happened over the last, geez, almost going on two years almost, um, that where we had to quickly uh, change over our assessment style to a remote uh, type of session. So that includes what you're on now, a, a go to meeting uh, resources, what we use to do the remote assessments. We are honoring and respecting um, all of our clients at this point with their level of comfort uh, with doing on-site assessments. Um, we have started to go back on site and encourage it if we can, and we just feel everyone out for their comfort zone as far as having people at their facility. Uh, if you're not comfortable with an on-site assessment because of you know the new COVID variant at this time, um, you know, again, just let us know and we'll switch it to a remote. We're hoping that next year we'll be able to go back to normal uh, with on-site assessments. Okay, and I had one last question. If you use an instrument with two separate AOAC methods, is it easier to accredit to the instrument and not just two methods? So when we do the accreditation, we are looking at a combination of things. We're gonna look at your the instrumentation in your laboratory. And even though the instrumentation might be able to accommodate multiple methods, we really look at both. So on your, your scope of accreditation, you're gonna have, uh, you might have your technique or your instrument listed multiple times, but we're gonna to wanna to make sure you're following the methods. We're really doing both at the same time. If you have more questions about that one, please send me an email and I can uh, talk to one of our program managers about that as well. Okay, so I think that was all for the questions. Uh, I'd like to provide everyone my contact information. If you're new to our company, obviously you have our website because you signed up for the for the webinar today. Here's my email directly if you have any questions for me after this webinar. Also like to inform you of a upcoming webinar coming up next week already. Um, as I said, we do free webinars every month. We have a uh, specialized webinar on section 6.6 .6 of the 1725 standard for externally provided products and services that will be held by our program manager, Mike Kramer. Um, so please feel free after this to, if you haven't already, to register and sign up for that webinar. 
Okay, so this concludes our webinar for today. I hope this was helpful. I know this was a lot of information. Again, this webinar will be available, the recording on our website. Um, and if you need a copy of the slides, we're also uh, more than willing to share these with you. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Again, please feel free to contact us if anything comes to mind and you have any questions and you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.